This is the OGM weekly call for Thursday, May 16, 2024. It is nice to see you all. Yay, Pete is back from his travels. Um, and we are today on a check-in uh, format. So I will explain it briefly because Dave is here uh, joining us for the first time, which is lovely. And uh, uh, so uh, it's funny, we, we kind of were going hot and heavy on topics every week and then everybody was like, you know, we really need more pauses, more, more like slowing down a little bit in our conversations and paying attention to each other a lot. So the check-in format, which started out as more like, hey, what's up, what's going on, has turned into a little bit more of like a Quaker meeting a bit uh, where we um, try to not use the chat. <clears throat> Um, I will step out until we're until every person is done checking in once. Uh, if somebody else joins us who doesn't know the protocol, I will uh, explain it probably in the chat. Uh, but um, uh, it, is the audio doing okay? Okay, good. I'm just noticing the the chat commentary from Gil. Um, and um, I will I will sort of step aside and only do explanations as necessary. I urge everybody to desist, uh, take notes somewhere else, and then pour them into the chat once we let the hounds loose at the end of check-in, and we'll switch to a regular conversational mode. Uh, and use the Zoom hand to put yourself in the queue if you'd like to check in, and then take your time stepping into the conversation. We like pauses here. We want to give ourselves time to be mindful, to pay attention to each other. Uh, and go from there. Um, no need to respond to other people during check-in. It's uh, just whatever is whatever's up for you. And sometimes on check-in, we will ask a higher level question, like what's the most important thing we could do right now or you would do with your energy or something like that. Uh, I'm not inspired to do that for this call. I think I'm just going to let it be a check-in because there's so much going on in the world that I'm interested in where we all are. If that all makes sense, I will um, mute myself and see who would like to begin the round. I'll begin. This is Jesse. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yes. Awesome. So I've been saying for a while. Hi, everyone. It's been a while since I've been. Nice to see your faces. Um, and I'm going to be off the camera because I'm going to be driving here in a second. But um, I've been saying a while, um, I'm, I want to connect the disconnected pieces of all of the people who are working on initiatives that are impact-driven and mission-driven. Um, and I didn't know how. I still don't know how, but that's my, that's my drive, is to support those who are working on those initiatives. So what I did for Amazon for eight years was helping people build high performance teams. And the one thing that I didn't like about that was everyone was high performance for farming and there was a lot of burnout. Um, and also I wasn't working on specific projects that I was, that excited me. Um, so I'm now going to focus my efforts on supporting those who are contributing towards the sustainable development goals. I think they're called global goals now and help them build their high performance teams, just like normal, um, but help them do it at a, in a more impact driven and data driven way. So they know that they're actually creating impact and, and contributing to those global goals. And a lot of times they're um, decentralized or they don't think that those, their social outcomes can can't be measured, meaningfully measured um, because they're long-term or intangible, but I, I know ways around that. And I also want to help them make sure that their team is balanced and their health is balanced. Are you seeing your audio is choppy? Oh, okay. Something. I just want to make sure. Okay. It seems, to, it seems to be an issue for Gil and we might help him troubleshoot his connection, but I think everybody else is hearing everybody clearly. Okay. So. Right, right. So yeah, um, and I want to work with government um, so that as often they're not able to measure. Um, they're using activities to measure their their outcomes, but I really want to measure the outcomes. So 
I am excited to work with anybody who's helping um, uh, it, the data part because I know the, the the organizational and culture part and teamwork part and health part. So instead of saying um, supporting work-life balance, it's more like supporting high performance and rejuvenation balance. And there's a lot of components of that from inclusivity um, on Jerry, you and I talked about, uh, you know, people that self-identify as neurodivergent um, uh, and I don't know that the data is often decentralized in itself. So there's so many different aspects of this, but because I, I, I know that they can't do it alone um, because they're decentralized and they want to connect those dots because the biggest time I've seen change, big change is when people are in the room that are in cross sectors. And so I want to, I want to actually model that somehow. Um, and I see that this, this meeting is a version of that. So, um, but I, I have for, <laughs> for a few months now have been saying, I'd like to, to collaborate on something. And I think this is a really a great, um, way to do so. And so if anybody's interested in talking more about that and collaborating together, I am all in. Thank you. Well, I guess I'm next. Um, I am back in Malaysia, which means it's in the morning here. Uh, Malaysia is a fascinating place to be at this time because in some ways it's more canary in the coal in the mine uh, and an early indicator of people's thinking about climate change. Uh, I keep being impressed by the fact that the world is still looking for how to come out of climate change with a larger economy, not a smaller one. Uh, we're producing more CO2 than ever. Uh, the GDP is up in most nations. Uh, it's kind of wacky that uh, you get a crisis and everybody wants to use it to increase private wealth. So I'll stop there. Yeah, so I'll follow. I'll follow Doug. I've had um, two trips to Asia over the past um, six weeks, and everything is booming. Building is booming. Economies are booming. It's just amazing. Um, I, I think that isn't the most impactful in some ways, aside from um, uh, Bangkok and Taipei, were. Um, mainland China, uh, Guangzhou and Shanghai. Um, I was kind of agape for the first few days. It's like, where am I? <laughs> I'm on mainland China, and it's an amazing consumerist society of a very high-end nature with um, 
probably 70% of late model electronic vehicles uh, on the roads, which are, are smooth. <laughs> nothing, nothing compared to, you know, the roads in California, which are just uh, awful. Um, so it was, it was kind of eye opening. Um, on that front, it's, it's interesting. Um, so the first couple of trips, um, I was kind of accompanying, um, uh, my partner, Jennifer, uh, and we've done the same work in the world for the past umpteen years. She working in K-12, especially um, in international English speaking schools and me in the corporate universe for the most part. Um, and she hasn't done much by way of um, interventions in dysfunctional uh, organizations. And I have quite a bit of experience doing that. And so there we are in uh, a dysfunctional school. So it's interesting how the work is is um, combining, which uh, pleases me no end. Um, yeah. Um, my myeloma is in great remission, which I'm very happy uh, about. I'm feeling um, well and healthy. Um, reports from both my um, um, primary care doc and my acupuncturist um so that's the latter being much more important to me um and in terms of um writing uh, i'm even just kind of enthused to even do a little start doing a little bit of outreach to organizations that i want to work with um so that's exciting to me because i thought i was kind of done um but i'm not <laughs> and it turns out that on the eve of my 78th birthday, I'm more energized than I've been in, in quite some time. Um, writing. Um, I'm working on a manuscript that is a combination of my observations of, you know, what I see in the world. And those of you who have been involved in the Neo Book Project have an idea of it. Um, it's a combination of, of, of my observations in terms of what I'm seeing in the world, some suggested interventions, um, poetry, and my, you know, uh, um, models for creating relationship slash collaboration and conflict resolution. And a while ago, um, I got a piece of feedback from a, a friend and colleague who's a professional writer. This is what he does. Um, he does ghost writing and, and he writes. And his, his feedback to me was, Stuart, I think there's a memoir in here that wants to be born. And I initially just kind of, um, I dismissed that. <laughs> I, maybe because I didn't want to write a memoir. <laughs> uh, but the more I thought about it and the more I look at what I've got so far, uh, I I kind of tend to agree with the professional. So I'm I'm in process of of reworking the manuscript in certain ways to add more personal reflections and to frame it um, in a certain way. And it seems to be a really good frame because it's filled with my own opinions, which seem appropriate for memoir as opposed to something that's academically researched and documented, et cetera. So I'm cool with that. Um, so all of that is to say, I just seem to be a pretty happy camper lately. Um, and that's my check-in. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that the world isn't just totally fucked up <laughs> in terms of the the insanity that we're all we're all dealing with, uh, and I think working hard to transcend at a personal level so we can continue to do our good work.
And I can add that I just had my 87th birthday. April 27th. <laughs> That's a proud age. Yeah, I was uh, uh, feeling, I mean, I don't even know how to describe it, but watching the news <clears throat> and around this, uh, um, the, how, how the political system coalesces around uh, a former president who you know, has a, a religious leader, you know, supporting a guy who has to defend himself against uh, by being a porn star. I mean, it's just incomprehensible. But the the whenever this the political noise level increases uh, uh, to such a degree, there's typically something behind it, um, and what completely escapes the general public and what the media is not reporting on. There is currently a bill on the on the docket, which is the farm bill, which is a $1.5 trillion bill that uh, determines our food system's uh, direction for the next five years. And the, the, the critical difference between the Senate version and the House version is that the Senate version reflects what the NGOs and, and uh, um, farm sectors really have been asking for, which is moving towards a more regenerative form, restoring nature, you know, okay. uh, in, in, intersecting, interject, injecting uh, uh, life back into the soil. And the house version is, is probably best defined by insisting that there can be no reference to climate in the bill. And that seems uh, that seems on at first glance like uh, yeah uh, that's that's awkward. But when you think about it, uh, by introducing climate smart uh, uh, into into the discussion, it provides a direction. You know, it's a it's a design imperative really. When you say that uh, what the investment these investments from the IRA, the twenty billion dollars must be climate smart. So that's the allocation of resources, and we're talking about one point five trillion dollars. So, to to and, and I got invited to um, to a meeting with Senator Stabenow's office, with the group that's working uh, on 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 the farm bill in her office on Monday, and the the. No, I mean everyone is trying to figure out how to position yourself uh, into in this. Uh, in this uh, debate here and my advice basically is focus straight on climate change because or climate smart because now you can engage the general public in an understanding of what this is and why it is so important in the farm sector because of the disruptions that industrial farming is causing in the in the uh, entire environment in the entire ecosystem so I've gone over, over these details many times before, but th I think this is really the moment in time when, when we uh, have to sort of collectively stand up and say the climate is changing. Agriculture is contributing one third of global emissions, which most people are not aware of. And in addition to that, it, 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 uh, um, it tries out millions of, of square miles of soil because the chemical applications destroy the soil microbiome, which in turn then the soil cannot hold water because it's the soil, it's the organic carbon in the soil that turns it into like a like a sponge to absorb and hold water and release it and drives the, the hydrologic cycles through evapotranspiration which is contributing roughly 60% of local rains. So these are, these are you know, factoids that, that uh, really haven't been uh, disseminated. So this is just a really crazy time right now, you know, because this is in my mind, I mean, I thought five years ago or last time that the farm bill was being uh, negotiated. This is last call to really do this right. And, and here we are five years later, 
But I, I don't think we can survive another five years of a misallocated uh, 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 farm uh, uh, incentive structure that pays farmers to do the wrong thing. So that's that's sort of behind behind the scenes, and it's really it's really too bad that the the public space is so noise polluted. You know that we we, have, we are unable to focus on on what are the really the critical issues we need to be dealing with. It makes it so hard you know, to to look at the news and see this this puppet show. Um, uh, taking our attention you know, into into completely nonsensical directions, um, but you now the the there is a book out uh, that was disseminated in foreign policy, and a guy wrote a book that summarizes uh, uh, Trump's uh, foreign policy and economic policy, and it's called "We Win, They Lose." <laughs> That's the book title. We win, they lose, right? I mean, it's unbelievable. And and uh, in there, it clearly states that you now climate change is is an exaggeration. It's happening, but nowhere near the scale that uh, it should influence our our uh, e uh, uh, economic policies to the extent that you know, uh, Democrats uh, uh, propose. So yeah, so this is this is uh, um, this is an amazing time uh transformative time and we just don't quite know yet where this transform transformation is going to to lead us to um yeah i mean it's uh, more than interesting to watch anyway so there has to be some upside somewhere um but uh, i'm i'm chasing it Hello, Dave Gray. Oh, I haven't seen you in years. Hey, Kevin. Hey, good to see, good you. To see you. Yeah. I'll go. Um, sorry about the lighting. I'm back down here in North Carolina and this was the most comfortable seat. I didn't realize it would be so dark, but comfort comes first. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was lucky enough on my drive down to get to meet with Pete and his wife and Mike, Mike Nelson and Mike Lennon, which was so much fun. So that made me happy because that's, that's one of my favorite things to do is to meet people in real life that I know from Zoom calls. So now I'm back here and I'll just refer to my red friend. Most of you know, it's the person that, you know, had totally different politics. Now she's out of it. But when I come down here, I also feel like I almost feel like a spy in some way, because I feel like I'm getting a handle on what's happening in some of these smaller groups around the church, you know, and I shared with her, it was scary, but to just go to what Klaus was saying, because I act, the farm bill actually came up yesterday and I don't know it in detail, but her point was like, we're too far gone. Our country's dead. You know, there's, there's nothing we could do to change it. And what I want to say is that, and this came up in our talk in, in 
DC too, is that sometimes we try to change people's opinions based on the same logic that helped us form our opinions. And that doesn't work because if they thought like we did, we'd already be agreeing. And so when I talk to my friend or other people down here and I want to push things that like Klaus may be talking about, I really focus on the health of the food and I focus on like the small farmer. And instead of talking about climate change, for me, it's I, I frame it more about, you know, business because they're looking for an enemy. So I would rather the enemy be the big guy, whoever that big guy is. And just talk about the need to take care of our soil and our water and the health of our food. So um, I will keep reporting and let you know what goes on. <laughs> and that's my check-in. And I hope to get to meet the rest of you at some point. I think I've met half of you so far. <laughs> I'll, I'll build on what Stacy said about how fun our our little dinner was in DuPont Circle. We, uh, some of you who have been to DuPont Circle probably know about Kramer's Books, which has a wonderful cafe and lots of outdoor tables. And that's where we had a very long conversation that covered a whole lot of everything, including some reminiscences from Dave and his wife and me about Caltech. I hope that wasn't too uh, annoying, Stacy. <laughs> Caltech is a very strange culture, and it's interesting. Um, now, now I think Stacy understands better why why we are the way we are. Um, one of the things that um, I wanted to share is a, a very powerful session we had yesterday at Carnegie. It was an internal meeting about women in foreign policy. And it was it was absolutely fascinating because we had a, a woman who has worked in the intelligence community and her specialty is tracking Russian military tactics and capabilities, which has got to be one of the most male dominated fields around. It's even more male dominated in Russia, of course, and she has to deal with some of these people. But one of the things that we talked about was how and we talked about this at our at our dinner too, is how when you come in, you want to tell people the facts and the context and you want to push them to think about them, but sometimes you don't want to tell them what the answer is. Because if you come in and act like I'm the PhD, I've studied this for years, this is the answer, their antibodies, their, their defenses go up and they they tend to ignore you or or at least look at you with suspicion and so the 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 wise way to do this is often to come in with here's what's going on here's some numbers that help us understand what's going on what should we do about it and 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 maybe you mentioned some ideas that are floating around in the ether but you make the person you're talking to part of the process, not just the recipient of your solution. And it's that's very hard for someone like me who comes out of Caltech and MIT. You know, we we do data, we do equations, we do models, we provide you with answers. And that that isn't always in politics, that's almost never the answer. Um and I'm seeing this right now with the debate over what to do about the internet, what to do about artificial intelligence. And, and data is almost totally absent, but so are real solutions. And I've mentioned this before, how 
how policy making in Washington in so many areas, including climate, including digital technology, it's being driven by myths and slogans and what feels good. And the other problem is that people are being totally overwhelmed with bullshit. Um, I, I just, it, it's the Steve Bannon rule, flood the zone with bullshit. And that is working for people. Uh, it, there was just this miraculous bill on TikTok. And just within a week or two, it passed the House and then passed the Senate overwhelmingly and got signed by the president. Incredibly poorly thought out, all sorts of unintended consequences. It sets some terrible precedents. And it's probably unconstitutional, so it will be in court for two or three years. But yet this, this bill just slipped by because everybody had concluded that TikTok was a national security threat, or at least a threat to our privacy, without actually looking at the bigger problem of how other websites, some of which are foreign-owned, some of which are not, are equally dangerous and not just to national security and our privacy, but also to our democracy. So again, it's the feel good kind of thing that's going on here in Washington. And it's uh, it's not making me feel good at all. And it's get, making me very, it's very hard to get motivated to write deep analytical thoughts about what's going on. And so I'm, I'm trying to split my time between the deep analytical assessments of what good digital policy looks like particularly comparing to other countries that are doing good policy. And this other piece of my job, which is debunking the myths. I mean, if we want good policy, we have to debunk some of these myths. And just to finish on this myths diatribe, yesterday we also had a fascinating session with a couple of people who were visiting from Germany who are very involved in their climate their, their climate foreign policy strategy. This is different than climate diplomacy. It's not just going to big international meetings like the COP meetings and negotiating some text about how soon we can cut carbon em emissions. It's actually climate foreign policy. It's the whole gamut of foreign policy actions related to climate. And so it's trade subsidies, it's uh, economic assistance, it's technology transfer, uh, and it's not just State Department, it's Department of Energy. There was a, a very effective speaker from the Department of Energy. But I asked them about myths, and it was fascinating to hear both from Germany and from the U.S. what myths are standing in the way of good climate action, of effective climate action. The German speaker, one of the German speakers said that the old myth was the, earth, the planet is too big. How could human beings possibly change the climate globally? That, that myth is, is gone. But now the myth is, well, it's just gonna be too darn expensive to do all this stuff we need to do. Which is interesting because it's almost the other side of the coin of another myth, which is, somehow magic will happen and in 10 or 20 years human ingenuity will just make the climate problem go away so i i i i'd love to see what you have seen about myths and, and policy i'm doing an event on monday with the people from the information technology and innovation foundation they've just released a book on scapegoats and fears, myths about AI, innovation, and the digital economy. And so we're gonna walk through some of these and figure out ways to, to just debunk myths. I'll put a link in the chat if you wanna register for this. It is at an awkward hour for those of you on the East Coast. It's at nine o'clock on Monday night. Uh, not a good time if you uh, have a late dinner in the East Coast, West Coast. Um, we're aiming for, for Asia, which is why we did it at that time. Thank you.
Good morning, everybody. Um, I was going to wait and, and share late in this, uh, but I'm and I wasn't sure what to share about. But I'm provoked by what Klaus and Stacy and Mike have just said. Uh, so let me start there. Actually, let me start by saying hi, Dave Gray. I haven't seen you for a long time. Nice to see you. Also, um, Mike, please keep writing. Um, however fruitless it may seem, those are critical that you do that. So thank you for doing that. Um, I'm a I'm a big fan of mythology, so I always get itchy when people talk about myths when they mean you know falsehoods um, and bullshit and like that. But um, I, I I hear you. Um, gosh, let me um, where to go with this. Um, so I'm very present to one of the myths that you name, which said it's just too darn expensive because uh, we deal with that at the corporate level. We've been dealing with that at the corporate level for 30 years where you know I and Andrew Winston and various others have been making the business case for responsibility around um, sustainability, climate action, inclusion, justice, and so forth uh, in, in the logical terms of business. Uh, and the evidence is pretty strong and the the mindset that we walk into, even from very smart executives at very capable companies is, oh, we can't afford to do this. And then we go through the details and go through the numbers. And it's remarkable because even when people look at the data, the mindset overwhelms the data. People can't, you know, people can't see the data because it doesn't jive with what they already believe. Um, and. Um, and for me, that's part of what I was hearing listening to Klaus and Stacy was, which is that we, and I tend not here to enforce our use of the word we, but I'll say we um, tend to rely on logic and persuasion and think that that will do the trick. Uh, and the game is much more complicated than that for at least two reasons. One is that humans are not truly logical, we're emotional and biological and historical creatures. And we are acting out of all that, not just the logic that's in front of us. And second, um, let's be real. This is a conversation about power. We talked about this in Living Between Worlds yesterday. I've been in a, a bunch of conversation with different progressive groups lately. And I'm including um, um, Marjorie, long webinar with Marjorie Kelly on her new book, Wealth Supremacy, which I commend to people. And in, in 75 minutes, the word power was not mentioned once. And I was just really stunned by that. Um, you know, the farm bill's not happening, Klaus, because people don't understand about soil. It's happening because of the, the you know power and money, uh, and bought Congress people and 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 economic interests that have you know that benefit by that kind of bill in different ways than you would want to see the benefit. Um, you know, and Stacy, in your conversation with your red friend, um, um, yeah, I get it. It's like um uh, i i love what you said about um i, I don't have the words what you, how you said it that uh, you know if they already saw things the way that we saw them they would agree with us well yeah yeah exactly so and getting somebody there doesn't happen by giving them more facts or more logic that's not in my experience that's not how people change and what i'm finding the most effective thing is to um well, one, Mike, what you said about not coming in with a solution, but coming in with some with some inviting questions into the story, um, uh, and in addition to that, is really engaging people and listening and inviting people to talk about what they really care about. You know, not what their position is, not what their solution is, not what their strategy is, but what is down deep motivating them. And in my experience and experience of my colleagues that when that's possible, when that conversation is possible, which ain't, ain't always, but when it's possible, often people have very similar cares and concerns. People care about the same things in their lives, for their families, for their communities, and they express that in really different ways. They build a different logic around it. They build different strategies around it, certainly build different political positions around it. But we're not going to win the game at the level of the political debate. We're going to win it at the level of engaging people about what we really care about. And when you go there, the polling is stunning because like 70, 70 to 90 percent super majorities on the key issues that we care about. When they're not framed as political adversary questions. But it's questions of what people really care about. So 
I'm thinking about that a lot. Um, we had a, a, a really rich discussion about some of the stuff um, in Living Between Worlds yesterday. We'll have the video posted probably by early next week. Um, um, and what else did I want to say here? Um, um, yeah, and huh, the the other thing that came uh, came to me clear from this call yesterday is that I really need to finish this book that I'm writing about the structural defects of capitalism. Uh, it may be a career killer book. I don't think I'll get another corporate engagement ever after writing it, but I'm not so interested in that anymore. Uh, I'm interested in you know sharing what I'm seeing and working one on one uh, with leaders and emerging leaders who care about this shit um, because I'm finding that I can really help people be more effective and more impactful and maybe even more sane in the midst of the mess that we're going through. Um, so, um, and the, yeah, so the one other thing I'll say by way of share, and I've talked with some of you about this before is that I've been, uh, um, um, gosh, how's it? Another place of myths is people's reaction to AI of like, this is going to, you know, change the world and everything will be groovy, or this is an absolute disaster, or this is the destruction of humanity, uh, which, of course, we have said with every new technology since forever. Um, um, so I've been waiting, and I've spent the last six months in a sandbox building some personal AIs. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, flipped that effort over to Delphi Dead AI, where I've put uh, a, a, a simulation of me all my writing, all my speaking, all my coaching conversations, of course, anonymized uh, to see what that's like and to see if that's something like that can be useful or stupid or what. So I'm in that experiment and um, we'll just point people to, um, what is it called? Peter Layden, L-E-Y-D-E-N. I guess this is, we're not supposed to do links right now, but the great progression has been looking at the beneficial possibilities of AI had a very provocative session a few weeks ago about AI and energy and climate, basically raising the question of, yeah, this is, you know, growing energy demand on data centers, et cetera. But what happens when you turn AI, in, uh, aim AI at the energy question uh, and look at massive improvement in data center efficiency uh, at uh, transforming the electric grid and so forth. So it's a very interesting and eye-opening session about those two different perspectives about this thing that is clearly on the table in front of us. And um, that's probably more than enough for me. So I'll stop there. Thanks, everybody. Uh, howdy. It's good to see everybody. Um, it was a real treat uh, seeing Mike and Stacy and Michael Lennon uh, in, in, in the flesh. Uh, we had a couple hours all together uh, uh, outside behind Kramer's uh, and the weather was gorgeous in DC. So it was a lovely, lovely, lovely conversation. Um, I highly recommend getting together with, uh, with OGM folks. Um, uh, Stacy and Joanne and I uh, also had uh, a few hours before that, um, we were staying out towards Fairfax County, Virginia. So we metroed in um, and spent some time at the museums and walking around DC. Uh, so it was just a blast. I, that was the culmination of a week. Uh, we were out in Virginia, Northern Virginia for my daughter's uh, master's graduation. <clears throat> She's got a master's in social work now from GMU. <clears throat> which is kind of interesting because my wife and I are both Caltech background, uh, as Mike was saying. Um, uh, so it's interesting. You have a, a humanities kid. I don't know if you've been, I, I don't know if I've, a human, a humane uh, person in the fold. Uh, she's going to be great doing whatever she does. Um, uh, with a couple friends, um, kind of from the OGM world, uh, I've, We've been having some discussions about how to foster important conversations um, with with people. Um, uh, I think mostly at scale is the idea that we're we're kind of thinking through. So um, we're we're still kind of organizing our thoughts, and you know, in in a month or two or something like that, we'll we'll start um, in, in incorporating more people. But one of the things that we got to in a discussion yesterday was 
why would we, you know, what, what outcomes do we want uh, for these important conversations, you know, making the world a better place, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we all think that. I surprised myself a little bit by, by kind of reiterating a, a, a stance or a, a position that I've had for probably 30, 40 years, where I actually don't care too much what conversations people have, as long as they're having, as, as long as they can find other other people have interesting and important conversations with. Um, and even if the conversations are a little bit toxic, um, I, I, I said it into the, the room with the, with the friends, you know, I, I, th I think mixing people with other people, humans are, are overall good. Um, and the way to, um, I don't want to say neutralize exactly, but the way to dilute and, and disempower uh, toxicity uh, often with people is to mix them with other people. Stacy's doing a great job of that. Um, so that was one surprise kind of thing that I've been, you know, that's the way I've been thinking about um, helping people work together and the, the different ways you can see me putting people and information and knowledge and stuff together. Uh, it's, it's in the hope that in doing things together, we we love each other more. We learn more from each other. Uh, we bend towards good uh, over time, and hopefully, you know, soon enough. The other thing that surprised me, I I, I uh, you know, I had my piece, and then uh, the other folks went, and then I said, you know, there's another thing, um, and this was uh, partly inspired by the conversation in DC, especially hearing Mike tell some of the, the backstories, uh, how how we may have how how Twitter may have been exploded uh, in very intentionally, or um, the thing that's happening with TikTok now, which is, you know, I, I think you can kind of look at the thing that's happening with TikTok and go, well, <laughs> there are there are worse players in the world, um, and I wonder if they've uh, you know they've got something to do with the, how how easily that all kind of sailed through uh, the U.S. consciousness and and the U.S. political system. Um, the the other thing, along with just getting people together to have uh, good, important conversations, is having us build resilience against um, against toxicity. Uh, we've got really powerful ways now of blinding people and confusing people and distracting people. And uh, some of us know a lot about it. Uh, it was it was a joy hearing Mike kind of talk uh, at length, you know, here's, here's this way, here's this way, here's this way, you know, it's happening all the time, all around us. Um, uh, some of us are very savvy about it. Some of us are kind of savvy about it. A lot of the US at least, and probably a lot of the world has no idea that they're being like intensely manipulated um, and not necessarily intensely manipulated for any particular position, any particular polarity. It's just, um, I want, you know, the, there's there's forces in the world that want to make the US as a, a world power confused and distracted and fighting amongst itself. And just, you know, uh, so it feels all of that is, it's, it's actually really frustrating for me to know that if, if people, you know, if, if people are knowledgeable and then they decide bad things, I feel like that's one thing. But if they don't even know that they're deciding bad things because they don't have any knowledge about it, that really hurts me. <laughs> um, not to mention all the, you know, all the, the waste that goes into um, keeping a big, com a big country like the U.S., for instance, fighting itself, just like grinding itself, you know, um, and not being effective at a bunch of things that it could be effective at, keeping its citizens healthy, um, you know, taking care of the planet and all that kind of stuff. We spent a lot, a lot, a lot of cycles uh, doing the wrong thing for the wrong reasons because somebody has kind of convinced us, oh, that's the right thing, you know? It's super, super weird. So I, an, another thing I want to do with the Important Conversations project is build that kind of resilience of surfacing ways that we get distracted by toxicity and, um, you know, learn to learn to diffuse that, learn to um, work with that, learn to grow out, out of 
misinformation and confusion. Um, I didn't, I, I don't, I don't want to talk about AI because everybody's talking about AI, but, um, uh, but it's, it's big. <laughs> um, the, I, the open AI, um, announcement on Monday, which was meant, I think, to, to steal the thunder from Google, uh, which was fascinating in the way that happened because Google had a lot of news that they shared um, on their you know, conference that should have been bigger news, but OpenAI kind of just like grabbed the thunder away from them. Um, and in, in some ways it was actually a, a I'm gonna say a fairly lackluster um, presentation that OpenAI did. Um, I mean, a lot of people said, "Oh my God, this amazing! Uh, this this new thing, and you know, it's, it's it's like science fiction come to life, and all that kind of stuff." And that's kind of true and kind of not. But the way that they did that announcement, um, I thought was really interesting, and uh, it it felt homey and safe and democratizing for everybody in the world in a way that. Google can't even think about at this point because it's too big and stumbles over itself. So that that part of the OpenAI I think was the the most interesting thing to me. Um, uh, and between OpenAI and Google and Apple and you know uh, Microsoft and AWS and all that. Um, uh, we can kind of see the the next 18 months is is just going to be ai everywhere in and, and it's going to be kind of it, i think it's going to feel like the internet or like pcs it's going to change the world and not change the world in in a lot of ways that a few of us can kind of like you know get excited about or get terrified about or both um, but it's a big deal. Um, the next 18 months with AI is, is going to rock our world um, for better or for worse. Um, so I, and my part in AI is trying to help people um, learn, learn the basics before, you know, try to learn as, as much as you can about what's going on um, kind of behind the scenes so that you can participate. Um, uh, there's an old saying, old internet saying, participate in your own manipulation um, is, is uh, everything to saying. And I really like that. So that's kind of why I'm so, uh, so interested in AI and trying to teach other people about AI. Which reminds me, um, I've been giving uh, 90 minute classes Kind of, kind of, they're very rambly, classy thing, class, classroom kinds of things. I've been doing that uh, free kind of open sessions uh, for a months now. Um, there's one today uh, at 3 p.m. Pacific. Uh, you're welcome to drop in, send me an email, and uh, say, "Hey, Pete, I want to see your your AI class thing." Um, I've been doing them twice a week. I, I might taper off and um, I need to build up some um, paid uh, teaching stuff too. Um, but uh, but send, send me an email if you're interested in rambling around. Uh, we talk about LLMs and image generators mostly because that's what I'm, I'm interested in. And sometimes we go really deep and in, in, uh, in the weeds and sometimes we get uh, practical. The people who have been attending are mostly non-tech folks. Um, uh, probably less technical than most of the folks here even. So uh, we, we spent a lot of time in non-technical explanations of how to use uh, LLMs and image generators and why and things like that. Um, thanks, it's lovely to see you all. Steve Gray sent me a little DM saying he, he's sorry he had to drop off the call to prep for another call, but he was happy to be here and we'll be back. Uh, the, the more you talked, the more I was like, oh, okay, this totally dovetails with what I want to talk about. And at the end when you're like, I don't really want to talk about AI, but 
I need to talk about AI. <laughs> it was like double, double fun because that's partly where I wanted to start uh, what I was going to talk about here. I just have, I think, two things to check in on. One is I'm trying to figure out how to push my brain farther into this AI space. And it's kind of hard. Um, and what I mean by that is historically, one of my superpowers, I think, is being able to imagine something that hasn't happened yet and then take it for granted and then see what the effects or implications of it are. <clears throat> so the moment I saw ICQ and uh, some of the instant messaging apps, I was like, oh, okay. So we're going to know what people's status is. This is going to be the way we talk, we call each other. We're not going to pick up the phone and interrupt each other with a phone call anymore. We'll do a little tippity tap. Um, <clears throat> and and I, I like the, the moment I saw instant messaging, I was, I, my brain was already putting itself into a world where that was a given. Now what happens? And I, and I love that. And I'm having trouble with that with AI because I think I'm having trouble loosening myself from treating AI as a better Google or something like that. And instead, as a colleague or something like that, I'm not exactly sure. And I'm not sure. And the person who's changed my mind on this the most is Ethan Mollick, uh, the Wharton professor who wrote the book Co-Intelligence, which I highly, highly recommend as an entry vector if you're curious about what to do here. And he's just, he writes really well. He's like enthusiastic, clear, quick, uh, gives great examples and is treating this with seriousness, with a little tongue in cheek, kind of. Like there's, there's a certain tone that he has that I really like. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out how to not get left behind because the way he's applying Gen AI is really powerful. Uh, and he's teaching his kid, his students to do that as well. Um, and just uh, one example, uh, he asks his students now, a, a new assignment he gives them is to do something impossible. <clears throat> and by what by that he means um, there's one team, one MBA team in his class who wanted to do a product. They were innovating some new product and they wanted to have a product prototype visible when they presented. And nobody on the team knew anything about CAD CAM or programming or anything like that. But guess who does? ChatGPT does. And so they used ChatGPT to prototype a thing, sent it off to a service. There are services online. You just send them a design. They send you back a box full of the widget you, you design. And for their presentation, they had physical demo, which would have been kind of impossible for them to do, given the skill set on the team. They could have hired it out to somebody or whatever, but they were able by themselves very quickly to do that. Also, the speed of change is, is really different here. So I, I like that, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to push my head into that new space. So that that's one check and thought. And then yesterday over beers, I, I, well, we went back to a trope that I really like a lot, which is, hey, how do we float a new story that people might really like? How do we put a new story in the world that involves fixing the world that is apolitical? Um, I love the political jousting. I think it's really fun to know what happened behind the scenes and how the sausage got made. And oh my God, oh my God, can you believe? That's not going to engage people. What engages people, I think, is something that helps them improve their world, that treats them as full and lovely humans, and that lets us all kind of move forward together. So I'm wondering what, what the story is. And I don't think the story, and this is going to sound like a weird plot twist, I don't think the story needs to be a vanilla, earnest, straightforward story. I think the story can be a little, can have a little character, can have um, some drama, can have some comedy to it. And so I'm really interested in how those kinds of things might uh, might actually work. Um, and happy to talk about that anytime. We could make it a topic for an OGM call. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, I have, I've collected a bunch of people trying to say, hey, we're missing the new story. And I think that that new story is really uh, crucially important. Um, Stuart, we're not done with checking uh, round quite yet. So I don't know if you're about to comment on this or what, but we're, we're still waiting for a couple yeah. people. Yeah, I just wanted to add a tidbit to my check-in. Your uh, appendix, go for it. <laughs> yeah, um, I heard something that was very impactful for me. It was, a, you know, one of the other, I think, you know, big conversations, uh, public conversations is the DEI conversation, whether you're DEIB, DEIJ, whatever that happens to be. And I heard a very um, accomplished 
um, African American speaker um, who's got a you know a doctorate from Columbia um, has spoken about this topic for many many years. Um, in a keynote, he said that all the DEI conversations are really about um, well being and belonging. Period. End of story. That's the underlying conversation. Everything else is just kind of noise. I just wanted to throw that out into the mix because I thought it was an important thing to share. It was impactful for me. Mm -hmm. Really enjoying the sharing so far and where the conversation and where the check-ins have been um, opening up and landing for me personally. I feel, I've been feeling really compelled by uh, the conversation around how to, or the check-ins around efficacy or um, how we have conversations with others who may not share our views in the way that's productive and um, effective. And I was really enjoyed all the points shared around this. I think I felt really compelled by uh, by Pete's take on this. And I, as, as I was listening and taking it all in, I think the imagery that came to mind for me when I consider what it feels like to me to, to have conversations with others who may be um, embodying a different worldview, it feels that the imagery that came to mind was it's almost like I'm trying to, to pick fruit from a plant that has already flowered and fruited and what is maybe needed more is the nurturing of the soil that the the plant is growing from and so I think that I I question I'm sitting with questions around the wisdom of trying to change minds period um I'm sitting with the question of what is is harm possibly being done when those conversations are conducted from a place that maybe both parties seem open and willing and like to think they're open and willing, but perhaps aren't open and willing to to engage with different ways of thinking. Um, I am curious around the, uh, the, I believe this is Zen Buddhist concept of non-interference and in all of this, particularly having conversations with others who um, might be holding closely and benefiting from in some unseen way the narratives and beliefs that make up their worldview and experience and perhaps bits of identity just it's all interesting to me i think for a personal check-in i'm uh finding myself feeling pretty optimistic and open-hearted recently um i've been really enjoying spending more time in my own creative craft. I've really been enjoying writing recently. I had my um, my first paid kind of formal speaking facilitation arrangement with the Olympic Imperial forget me, just maintenance in my apartment right now. So if you're hearing background noise, that's what you're picking up on. Um, but yeah, it was super fun to have that that, that gig. Um, the, the birds didn't fall out of the sky and I learned a lot and it was, uh, it was just something I really enjoyed. And so I'm feeling optimistic following following that engagement and um i think being a little more mindful about how deeply and how often i engage with some of these narratives that i personally feel pull me um maybe i find myself easily being pulled out of what i would call my uh my personal power when i engage with them and uh i think what, what's been coming to mind throughout the call is this, I, I know it's not the first time we've talked about, it. I think Jesse has presence this into the call before, but there's this uh, this concept of, the, it's called the drama triangle by many, it's Stephen Cartman's drama or disempowerment triangle, um, came out of the 1970s, where uh, it's, it's this framework or model of understanding um, humans as they come together in relational roles and um, when we can uh, play out roles for one another that ultimately I would say continue to feed dysfunction relationally into the, the three roles. They go by different names, but generally it's uh, recognized as the like the bully, the victim, and the rescuer, right? And this is uh, a model I really enjoy playing with 
um, when I study, as I continue to study this idea of like what personal power really is and what uh, what are the what's the anatomy of personal power and what takes. I'm going to move rooms because that that's going to be loud for a minute. My apologies. Um, but yeah, so so as I engage with um, the more popular mainstream narratives that are being pushed around what's happening in the world, what my place is, what my role is in all of it. Um, I can't help but continue to come back to where where am I being pulled into that triangle? And when I'm being pulled into that triangle, am I also uh, being pulled out of my sense of personal power? And so to round out that point, just noticing how much more effective I seem to be in the world, not just in the things that I do, but also how often I can remain in my like center, what I would call my center and like my my heart when engaging with others, when I am not heavily engaging with uh, the news. And while I look forward to the day where I, I might be able to engage in both and still remain open and um, feeling like I'm, I'm most effective in my day today, I don't feel like I'm there yet. And so I'm just um, trying to be patient with, uh, with myself and observe and learn from the process as I continue to engage. I think I feel complete with that. Bill, I think you're the only person who hasn't gone yet. And I'm wondering if you'd like to go or you're welcome to pass. I'll pass. With that, I declare these Olympic Games open. Doug, it looks well, like you want to uh, say something. Jump on in. Yeah. Um... I'm struck by what's not in the conversation, uh, but for me, what ought to be in the conversation is uh, the rising exponential curves of uh, food prices, droughts, floods, and consequential deaths. Uh, the tsunami of deaths from climate change issues is starting to hit, and we're not talking about it. Yeah, which is why it's so unnerving to see the complete denial, you know, of of the topic, not just a rejection of uh, discussing it. So the the official position uh, in the Republican House at this point is that climate change is exaggerated, 
um, it's not nearly as uh, uh, impactful as the economic initiatives would indicate. Uh, I mean, it's just a it's just a you know, blatant denial of reality, um, and it is profoundly impactful because we keep setting switches, you know, in the economy, the, which is driven by incentives, you know, via grants, subsidies, uh, tax policies, and so on. That that's just continuing to steer us into the wrong direction. But the the thing is, the the food system is as massive or even maybe more so than the energy sector. So any kind of disruption um, in, in the way we call, process, and distribute food is impacting massive companies. It's a trillion dollar part of the economy. Uh, so so the, the business models uh, that, are, that are in place today have cemented in the way we uh, call, process, and distribute and consume food. And to change that is as risky as changing the combustion engine to electric. You know, when you think about uh, all the people in the process who spend a lifetime doing this, and all of a sudden uh, it becomes that. Uh, but we are we are still in denial, and and uh, not only not not only are we in denial, we are actually actively uh, 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 supporting and exporting. The way we call foods, you know, to other countries. I mean, uh, now Doc, you can uh, uh, talk about you know what's happening in third world countries because you know we are exporting our fertilizer plants and you know our GMO crops and so on. So it is it is enormously scary. Um, to me, this is even more important than the energy sector. Um, because the damage done by the way we call food goes way beyond uh, uh, emissions, which is, after all, one third of global emissions comes from the food sector. But we're damaging the entire biosphere in the process. You know? and, that, and that is not being calculated into the equation. Or, so it is, I don't, I don't know, if, if does it really have to collapse uh, before we get to move? Uh, it, it seems... It seems uh, incredible to watch. <clears throat> Thank you, Klaus. I think what what I'm struck by, and what what um, Klaus you're sharing brings me back to, is what Mike spoke into the room earlier. I'm gonna paraphrase, but uh, the, just the power of the white noise of bullshit and the its its ability to drive us into overwhelm, which I would offer is is probably. Um, as easy now as, as it's ever been. And I think um, it, it just calls to mind. I don't think this is the first time I've spoken this into this space, but I have this whole uh, this this whole idea of, the, I call it the mathematics of denial. And it's, it just seems like it's, um, to me, it feels like it's super predictable uh, for for experience um, humans moving into denial when the, you know, the, the proposed or the possi possibility that we're considering uh, just outweighs or outnumbers the like degree of embodied internal resources our system has to hold it, right? And so if if I'm trying to hold the possibility of something that challenges my nervous system in such a way that it pushes me outside of this like so-called window of tolerance, it's just not going to land. Like, if I can't I can't continue to think about it. I won't be able to continue to engage with the idea in a productive manner. I'm just in overwhelm, right? And so I think that. Um, I just I think of that again and again as I hear and, and learn more about what's happening with climate change, but also all the other so many of the other crises that that we're facing collectively. Like I, I just can't help but feel like so so much of the problem is that we are collect our systems collectively are in overwhelm dysregulation and we just can't accommodate and engage with ideas that push us further into overwhelm or, or perceived or felt sense of threat. And so to me, that, that also brings me back to that, that concept of what can we do to nourish and nurture the soil before trying to pick the, the fruits from the plant. Thanks, Patty. I just put in the chat that I wish we had a soil health tax, that if you improved the health of your soil, you got money from the government. And if you depleted the health of whatever soil you are in charge of, you had to pay a lot of money to the government. Uh, and this would create some financial incentive for industrial farmers to head toward regenerative farming, I think. And it would create a, a relief 
and a benefit for regenerative farmers to be able to afford the, the conversion. Um, cool, Gil. Didn't, I didn't know that that's exactly what it's doing. Um, I will go look. Go ahead, Jesse. Well, you're speaking my heart, Klaus and Patty. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Um, I, but as you all know, incentives come from what we measure. Um, that's what I brought up in my share. I feel like if we talk about less about, you know, solutions and, you know, taxing are great solutions. Um, but if we go before that and look at our KPIs and, you know, KPIs influence incentives, what we measure does that. So if we're going to disrupt the status quo, to me, I think we should look at measures to impact the incentives. But also the fact that we're not, we're very decentralized in our approach to go after what, you know, Klaus, you're doing on your own thing. I'm doing my own thing, but we are, in, you know, working on the same goal and through cl cross collaboration, it impacts the current experience of present moment awareness and feeling our feelings fully, which performance, high performance and trying to, you know, react and do stuff disconnects us from that. Just, trying to, it's a struggle. It's overwhelming. When you, when I hear the word overwhelming, I hear struggle and inefficiencies and um, isolation. So my thought is let's, let's, let's come together and do one meeting, just one meeting and workshop the measures of not just food, you know, uh, welfare and, um, but the measures of SDGs all together, like, but collaboratively, you know, let's work on the measures and then, and then that may look at the incentives. So there you go. Thank you. Go ahead, Chip. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Jesse. And I'm sorry I missed your uh, your opening share because of computer problems on this end. Um, we incentivize what we measure, but we measure what we want to incentivize. You know, there's a loop there. <clears throat> and, and the basic loop now is that we incentivize the accumulation of financial capital and power and political power. We, you know, whatever the we is here. Uh, and so, you know, getting together to talk about this is all well and good, but it has to include talking about how do you shift the political power to enable that to happen. Um, so, um, and that's a longer conversation too. I, I do want to come back to one thing. I think it was um, Jerry, when you were talking about Ethan Mollock, who, by the way, has a great, there's a great article in Forbes that summarizes the four, uh, the four rules of co-intelligence, um, which I will see if I can put in the chat, given my technical glitches here. Uh, but, you know, challenging people to do the impossible is a great technique. And um, my uh, one of my favorite experiences with that, I was in a business development course a decade ago. And uh, on Friday at noon, the organizers broke us up into teams of four. Um, um, most people had were entrepreneurs with projects of their own. So break, teams of four, pick one of your projects. And over the course of the next 72 hours, launch that business. And people went crazy. It's like that's you know se you know seventy two hours way too short. It's a weekend. Can't possibly reach anybody. But all the impossibles came up, and the deal was whoever had the most money in the bank at noon on Monday, not just like a website up, but actual and not just people interested, but people who had put money in to a bank to buy the product by Monday. You know, seventy two hours later, won the prize. Uh, and uh, it was amazing to watch the process that people went through in, in my own group and watching the other ones and the resourcefulness that came out of just like, this is impossible. What do you do? Uh, and anyone want to guess how much money was in the bank for the winning project 72 hours later? 12000 $250,000. And that just blew apart everybody's minds about what's possible and what's impossible. And that's in a particular domain. You know, your mileage may vary, doesn't apply to everything. But 
but design with constraints and fiddling with the constraints is a very powerful technique. So I'm interested not in abstract conversations about what should we measure, but about, you know, hard driving innovation in a context of all that, you know, I love who was it who said, Stuart, um, um, I am I am really tired of the acronym soup, but I love the distillation of well-being and belonging uh, that you offered out of that out of that soup. So that's it. Thank you. Ken had a conflicting yeah. client call, so he's not uh, available for one of his poems. Go ahead, Stuart. Yeah, so I just um, posted this in the chat, but as I listen to this conversation, I think about how much gunk the U.S. has exported to the rest of the world <laughs> while maintaining its, you know, doing its best to maintain its image of the, you know, the righteous beacon on the hill. Um, uh, you know, I guess it was triggered by 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 Klaus's um, sharing that the bill in the House says you can't mention climate. I mean, you know, it's just an an amazing example of of, of stupidity. You know, we've exported litigiousness to the rest of the world, development to the rest of the world, um, regenerative farming. Not regenerative, yeah, regenerative farming or, or nasty farming to the rest of the world, industrial farming, the idea of, you know, of, of, of supply chains all over the world that are, um, um, you know, contributing to, 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 to climate change. Um, capitalism run amok. Uh, and and yet we keep electing folks that are just um, you know antithetical to um, what a real beacon on the hill might be. Uh, <laughs> here you have it. Yeah, I watched yesterday uh, a new frontline report on Venezuela and the corruption <laughs> uh, in there. It's just, it's, I mean, mind blowing, right? And then you realize this is us, right? I mean, because you can pick humanity at any place in the world at any time in history, and it's just a rerun of the same stories. You have people who, you know, get into positions of power and uh, and they start uh, not taking care of their own. And Venezuela is just the most blatant exercise. It's just absolutely incomprehensible how how many what, what no one really talked about and what that wasn't represented in this documentary is all the people who got hurt who are I mean when they when they imported foods you know and they put in like fake fake milk and and uh milk made from rice flour I mean just insane stuff well that was fed to children you know who suffered from this and got mal malnourished and you know people in Venezuela suffer from the corruption that this is all causing um so the the when you, this is the 21st century when you look around the world you know, the predominant forms of government i mean it's medieval it's uh, you know nothing has changed in our psyche um and the, the 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 real challenge is to to elect and hold accountable leadership you know, that uh, drives these economic decisions and we just haven't figured out how to do it and every time that this collective gets to be too successful, it gets crushed. Now, I mean, even even here in the U.S., you know, I mean, we're in the process of crushing it and and maintaining the dumbest things that you can possibly do. the The added element this time is that there is a natural world, a biosphere out there, that has an opinion apparently. Now, and so as we continue to destroy it. Um, um, there, no, there is nothing you can do with invented realities and and make believe uh, storylines. So it it's, I mean, we we just know too much, right? I mean, you watch it and you go, oh, I can't believe my eyes, <laughs> and, and here it is now.
Uh, Gil, go ahead. Then I'd like to jump in. Yeah, Klaus, have you have you noticed when you look at the cycles of history and the you know the the kind of ongoing familiarity of these kinds of messes that they cycle, and we have figured it out, and we've made progress and fallen back, and we've won and we've lost, and that's the nature of the game. You know, it's not that it's not like we fix it and all is la 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 perfect forever. It's that this is the dynamic of humans, uh, and it's a good time to reread the dawn of everything uh, as a reminder of that. And the challenge is to, you know, learn what we can and do the best we can in the particular mess we're in now and move it forward. We've had, uh, you know, um, for, from my perspective, we've had, I don't know, 70 some odd years of pretty substantial progress on a lot of the things we talk about, care about. Uh, and we're in a cycle where it looks like it's backsliding hard or is risking backsliding harder. Um, and... Um, I take some kind of philosophical comfort in in, in the no notion that the, you know that it goes down and it goes back up and it goes down and back up and the question is what do we do now, um, um, without like uh, you know, without a sense of utter doom because that's just naive, um, um, but a sense of real you know real trouble, in a game that is cyclical that we've played before, um, and figure out how do we you know how do we do the best we can to win in the current circumstances. And that's a little rambly I'm, I'm, that I'm saying, but I want to, um, I, I like where you started about, you know, the, the, um, the, this ever present drama in human history. Uh, but I dispute your conclusion that we don't know what to do. We do. Let's do it. That's all. Um, I feel it's funny. I, I feel like maybe I'm more optimistic than you are. I have a naive feeling that the thing ratchets in the right direction. Uh, that it's not just an endless cycle of samsara that we're just like in this crazy same cycle, but rather <laughs> it turns out that women have the vote and people who don't look like my demographic are participating and have the vote. And there's been backsliding. There's all kinds of the, 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 the counter, uh, the ultra conservatives basically always fight back to try to keep what they had. But in, but in general, I think humans, our, our ability to do that, keep getting better in different ways. <laughs> We, we we don't disagree. Yeah. And, may, and maybe the arc of just of, of history bends toward justice. And right. on the other hand, on, on the other hand, white women in America broke for Trump. So you know, <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read the identity politics too tightly. Um, uh, we don't disagree. Uh, I'm I'm calling I'm I'm not calling myself optimistic anymore. I'm a futurist who stopped predicting the future. Uh, and so I'm trying to read the signs and navigate it as best I can. And. Uh, 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 um, for me, part of the interpretation depends on the time scale that I'm looking at the arc of history at. You know, and in a long arc, yeah, I think I think I would tend to agree with you. In a short arc, it's really uh, horribly messy. And in between, who knows? And look, I, you know, we just there's no way to know what's coming in the next few years. Uh, I mean, there's certain things we can be you know be predictive about, but so much that we can't because who you know who knew what was going to be happening with with AIs. Aside from folks deep in it, you know, a couple of years ago, um, plastic for me is who knew that the Berlin was going to fall and the Soviet Union was going to fall six months before it happened. So I think the job now isn't to try to predict the future, but to prepare to dance with this enormous contingency and uncertainty and do good work and do the best we can, you know, with what we have where we are. We would love to be somewhat involved in trying to cause the future to tip in different places if if it Hell needs yeah. tipping in different ways. If you don't, um, like the, if you don't like the news, go out and make some of your own. Yeah, exactly. A different I just, thing I wanted to say. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. I just, I just, I, I just wanted to say we, we need each other as reminders <laughs> of the different perspectives that each have elements of truth. And I, I just put a poem um, in the chat, today's poem, which is called Engage. I think which which speaks to um, what we're all kind of doing here. I'm happy to read it if you want, mm -hmm. at some point before we sign off. Mm -hmm. That's great. Why, why don't I, uh, I had what comment I want to put it in, then we've got Pete uh, who's raised his hand and then maybe we go to your poem. Um, oh, the, the thing I wanted to say was about governance and we, we had the four separate extra calls on governance, but I'm still interested in how do you create um, less corruptible forms of governance? And I think it was in the pre-Jerry's brain call that we started uh, talking about pirate um, governance. 
And there's a guy who did some really nice uh, videos. I just put the, the first of them or one of them up, which is how to be a pirate captain. And pirates had really very, very interesting uh, organized governance in different ways. They had insurance. So if you participated in a pirate raid and you lost an eye uh, or a leg or whatever, you got paid insurance after that. It was kind of well known. And uh, who, the quartermaster would keep the books afterward. But the, the captain was an elected position, unlike in the British Navy, where captains could be absolute imbeciles and and it was an inherited position in in pirate trade um you elected a captain and the captain only got two shares of the booty of whatever was was left at the end of of the last raid i always thought the captain got a whole bunch more but captain got one two shares quartermaster got one and a half shares everybody else got one share and i imagine some junior people got like half a, half a share or something and i imagine it wasn't as tight as i just described it but it was far more democratic than I thought. And then one of the things that that he says in the video is, oh, and by the way, if you didn't like the captain, you could like leave at, at the next port, you could kind of slink away because it wasn't like there was a global authority going to hunt you down and kill you. Certainly the British Navy, the Spanish Navy, the people you were committing piracy against were hunting for you, but there was no enforcement mechanism inside the pirate community for, if you didn't like it, you, you the law of two feet actually applied within the pirate realm. It's really interesting. So how do we create less corruptible? I don't think there's such a thing as an in, uh, as a perfectly incorruptible, but how to create extremely less corruptible forms of governance where they, they can still get things done, but the incentive to uh, do things poorly uh, isn't there. Uh, Gil, the, the YouTube video I put in is the pirate link, and I'll put another link into my brain for that spot. But that, that is the YouTube link. Um, so Pete and then Stuart. Thanks for your attention and pastime. I appreciate it. I just wanted to, to have a, a counterbalance, Jerry, to you. I, I, I don't disbelieve your ratcheting up theory. Um, I think things have improved over the past thousand years. Um, I think they had gotten a lot worse uh, in the five or 10,000 years before that. So, you, you know, you, you guys know that I'm a, you know, I love tech. I, I love the AI stuff. I love what's going on. I'm not sure. I think humanity went off the rails 10,000 years ago or so. Um, I, I think we had a lot more humanity when we were a bunch of pastoralists uh, scraping and grubbing and, and kind of chilling um, across the land uh, and not overwhelming the land. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I don't wish to go back to that time. Um, and I think the best way out is through. So um, I'm cooperating, you know, with the rise of AI. I'm not fighting it, um, but I would trade it. Uh, I would trade where we are now uh, for where we were, you know, 10,000 years ago. Just a Thanks, thought. Pete. Thanks, Pete. Um, Gil, your hand is still up from before. And um, Stuart, if you'd like to read your poem, that would be great. And we can go uh, out with that. Sure. So the, the antidote um, I, I have found over time to being um, unhappy, miserable, uh, 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 pessimistic is to just stay engaged with projects, you know, congruent with the words that we've all heard, you know, do what you can where you are with what, with what you have. Today's poem is called um, Engaged, um, the reflective question, how engaged are you with current work and a mission? Is your daily work aligned with a purposeful mission? Uh, engaged. Joy of deeply felt traction. Engaged by passion. <clears throat> driven to action. Striving something bigger than you. Deeply committed. Heart is true. Not about money, fame, recognition. Not about you. About mission. Something noble can't do alone. Something grabs deep in the bone. Pulling you toward a vision, a dream. Guiding actions, creating a scheme. Longing heart, satisfied, filled. No pining, motivated, willed. Compelling what you do each day. A purpose with you lighting the way. Buzzing inside comes from source. Loved ones can't abide they divorce. Driven by purpose and urgency, clear conviction makes you free. Righteous abandon, lightning spark, 
your shining makes light of dark. That's right. Um, and thank you all. Thanks, really everybody. appreciate you being here. Uh, I think for next week, I'm interested in going back to where we were last week and structuring in a tiny bit more. Uh, if you have thoughts about that, put them on the list, put them on Mattermost. Uh, but uh, let's let's dig back in. I think this is an important set of topics that we want to do more with. So, thanks all for now. <laughs>